Okay. Um, good that you're here. Thanks. I know I'm keeping you from lunch, um, which means we're going to build a plugin before lunch. Well, that's something. Um, I'm going to talk about extending Vonk Fire Server. Uh, just a quick question uh, up front. Who has ever seen or used Vonk already? Quite some, about half. So, yeah, cool. <laughs> um, then you might also know who I am already, but this is me, and it's primarily here for my contact details for the recording. And uh, this session, we're going to build um, and add a plugin component to Funk Fire Server. Uh, and I'm going to make you understand how to do that. All of this is uh, already documented, and we're following along uh, on an example that we uh, put on GitHub yesterday, so you can follow along afterwards uh, by just uh, cloning the repo and see how it's done. Uh, and you can always ask for, uh, for any of us. Uh, me, I'm well-seasoned in the .NET API and also in Vonk. Alexander, my colleague, who has actually built this plugin, and uh, Marco, who's already, already here, <laughs> who knows everything about Vonk and about deploying it, by the way. Uh, and obviously, you can ask me. So um, for those who don't know it, uh, what is Vonk? It is his fire server. Um, and it's uh, actually one of the first. <laughs> Uh, we have multiple storage implementations for different types of databases, Mongo, SQL. You can use it as a facade on top of your own database that you already have. Um, you can use that as plugin framework. Obviously, that's what we're going to talk about today. It's built on .NET Core and it's cross-platform. It runs on Windows, but also on Linux, on Mac OS. Uh, it's a reference implementation on uh, .NET, which means we're very uh, specification compliant. We have uh, implemented much very much of the of the RESTful API. And uh, you can deploy it uh, where, when, and how you see fit in the cloud, on-prem, whatever you like. What is Vonk looking like inside? Uh, you have, it's an out-of-the-box server. Uh, there are a couple of components in there, though. Um, you have, uh, I think I can point with this somehow. Maybe not. Yeah, there. Um, so you have components in there that do the actual functionality and there's a repository uh, abstraction below that abstracts away access to the actual storage. That's how we implement multiple storages. And um, Funk is built on ASP.NET Core, which is the web application framework in .NET, as you probably know since you're here. Um, and ASP.NET Core is a pipeline for HTTP requests. Well, Vonk is also a pipeline, but for fire requests. And it's actually built like you see here. So the uh, Vonk request is uh, kind of inside the HTTP request. And it runs through the same pipeline which makes it conceptually easy to understand for people who have built uh, web services on ASP.NET Core already. So how does it work with these components? You see uh, all of them here, a couple of them. Um, so it could start with an HTTP interpreter. So we know, we know what the Fire Fire RESTful API looks like. Um, and we get an HTTP request in, and we have to translate that. So if it's a get and there is a resource type and there is an ID, it's probably a read interaction. Um, there could be smart and fire scopes on there. There could be all kinds of things. Uh, if there are extra search parameters, oh, this might be a search. So, and we, we translate that for you. Um, you could have a prefer handler, which tells you uh, how to, what to, uh, what to um, respond. And there are a couple of other handlers uh, like transaction, we build that in and we build search create all these operations that you have in the RESTful API. All of them are separate components. Now the fun of this is that you can add your own components. That's what we're going to do today. A short word about facade, that's not what the session is about, but to complete the picture, um, that repository implementation 
um, you can add your own implementation. There's two interfaces, I, the search repository and the change repository, which do what you would expect them to do. Um, and you can implement them on top of your own database. And then all these components use only the interfaces, so all these components start working on your own legacy data. That's a very interesting topic, topic but not for today. Um, if you want to put a plugin into Funk, you first have to get Funk. Um, and you can download it from Simplifier. Uh, you just need to log in into Simplifier, which is free. Uh, the evaluation license for Funk is also free. Um, production usage of Funk, by the way, is not free. Um, it's fully functional. All the components are in there. Uh, you can get it as a Docker image, um, but useful for experimenting with plugins are the, the binaries. And you can get them from the same location. So, we saw this pipeline of components, and now we're getting into code, because um, this is that case. And what we see here is how this pipeline is actually configured. If you get Funk out of the box, um, there's an app settings JSON. It's actually called app settings default JSON for Funk. This is the default name for uh, ASP.NET Core. And it includes a piece that's called the pipeline options. And it just tells you what is where in the pipeline. Um, these are high level uh, namespaces and it will just include everything under that namespace. And you can be as specific as you like. You can also exclude things like here, the specification zip is excluded. Yes, that's because Vonk has all the information about the specification in its database, which is included somewhere here. If you start Vonk, it produces a log file uh, where you can see what actually is happening. And if something is not happening correctly, you turn the log into verbose and you can see a lot what's happening. But this is on the information level to, to tell you whether the pipeline is how you expected it to be. Um, it's not, I left some pieces out because it's pretty long, uh, but what you can see here, it, oh, that's the wrong button, um, is where it looks for its components here in these assemblies. We're gonna add an assembly to that. Um, and it also tells you what configuration it uh, got from the pipeline options. So um, it uses Fire R3, Funkus SCU3. Uh, it can produce the, com the capability statement, which is the metadata configuration, et cetera, et cetera. And we have, you can search the administration API, which is a different topic in itself. So you can check what's actually in, uh, in there. And it also tells you whether it only provide some services or it's actually a component in the pipeline. Now, what we're gonna build here is a plugin for the document operation. Um, anyone familiar with the document operation? That's not many. Uh, it's there to, uh, to like bridge the gap between the document space and the fire space. Um, and it starts with a composition resource. The composition resource tells you what's in the document over what should be in the document. And the dollar document actually um, creates the document based on the composition resource by reading the composition resource and then uh, reading all the references to other resources that have to be in the document. It retrieves all those resources, adds them to a bundle, and then returns it to you. This was not in Funk yet. So my colleague decided it should be there and build a plugin for it. Um, first of all, you need a project to build this in, always. And that's a, just a normal .NET Core library project, file new project library, that's it. Um, and the funk packages that you use for it are on NuGet for download. Oh, so you can just uh, add, that's one, yeah. So you can just add them uh, as a normal NuGet package here and here. <coughs> now we have a project it needs to do something so we add a surface that's actually capable of handling documents so that will be that component that I was talking about that's about to handle 
um, our Vonk context, not the HTTP context, but a Vonk context. Um, so we're going to build this, and it has a method that says uh, um, act on. We want to do a get of the composition. Composition is in, is in the database. You can get it, you can read it, and then create the document of it. And what happens then? The service class is nothing special. It's just a class. It has no special things. The method handling your stuff um, is not so special either, um, but it handles a Vonk context, which is the counterpart to the HTTP context, but then with some information in it. We'll get there um, shortly. It's important to make it asynchronous. Um, <coughs> if anyone is not familiar with asynchronous programming, you should be if you're building a web server, because uh, you don't want to block all the other requests, etc., before you uh, are done handling. Um, and it acts on the uh, wrong contact, I told you that, and it has an important attribute. It's the interaction handler attribute. The interaction handler attribute will tell Vonk when to call this service. Because you don't call it on every request. If someone is doing a read, you don't do document. If someone is calling a search, you certainly don't return a document bundle, you return a normal search bundle. Um, so the interaction handler allows you to specify what to filter on before you get a chance to actually handle this. In this case, it's a custom interaction on the instance level because we act on composition one, two, three. And it's a custom interaction because it's a dollar document interaction. It's not one of the predefined interactions in Fire. Um, so the custom operation is called document. You can see that there. Uh, this is only on a get request. And uh, we only act on the composition resource, not on others. So you can filter all that here. And if it doesn't comply to this, you won't even be called. So you don't have to worry about other things in your service. Uh, you can also filter on the response code, which is not relevant to this example. Uh, how does this work? If you have this uh, pipeline of components here, then for every component, this is evaluated. And let's say there's a create component. Obviously, there is one. Uh, it will say, oh, skip. This is not a create interaction. Uh, it's also not a search interaction because that would say vonk interaction dot type search. Um, then we come to the document. It's, oh, I can handle this. And that will provide the response and the rest of the pipeline will not even be touched. So as soon as a component provides the response, you're done. there's always one that will be called. If there are multiple matches, the first one that matches will be called, which is, uh, can be helpful, like if you want to do something special for search on allergy intolerance, uh, you could put the plugin in front of the normal search and it will act on allergy intolerance and then all the rest will still be caught with the normal search. Yeah. I had a question here. <coughs> Uh, yeah, that's a fluent alternative coming up. Okay. Yeah. Um, so then configure it into the pipeline. Uh, that's where you register your services in the dependency injection framework. Uh, I'm not going to explain all of dependency injection, uh, but Vonk leans heavily onto it. So anything, any services, other services uh, that you need uh, from yourself or from Vonk, just have them injected in your constructor and you're done. Um, and you actually add your plugin to the pipeline by using a configure method on iApplication Builder, which is exactly the same way you do it in ASP.NET Core itself. But order is relevant. And that's 
what I just said, if you want to act specifically on a sp uh, differently on a specific resource type and then catch all, then you have to put it in front. And this order tells you whether it's where it is in the pipeline. So um, you need the right order. And if you take a look at the log that we already did, then certainly you will see all these numbers, which tell you tells you the current order of all these components. So you can just, hmm, I want it before that and after that, and there's plenty of integers between, so you can choose. Then, configure services. Um, just like any GI configuration, the only thing that you have to be prepared is multiple invocations, because um, it could be configured on different branches of, of uh, of the application and then it might be called twice. Uh, that's simple done by triad scoped, which will add it only once. Then plug it into the pipeline. Um, we should just say, use a Vonk interaction here. This is the service I want to, be call, want to call. And if it's called, with the von context, we will call this method. And it's a handler. Return the builder because this is also um, fluent. Now, you can, uh, what this actually does, it wraps your service into middleware as we know it from ASP.NET Core. So then it will be in the normal ASP.NET Core pipeline. Um, but you don't have to write a middleware class to do that with a request handler and um, an invoke, etc. You can also choose whether you do a pre, a post, or a normal handler, which I will explain here. We're going to build a normal handler. It will provide the response to the request. Other options are a pre-handler, which will um, inspect the request, but not provide the answer, unless there is an error. Uh, an example for that is in Vonk, we have pre-validation. And if you turn that on, every resource that comes in is validated against the profile. If it doesn't comply to the validation, then the pre-validate will end the pipeline and return you an error. But if it does comply, it will just move on to the next. Um, there are post handlers. And one example is the handler that uh, picks up changes so it can put them in the subscription uh, queue. And the other one is a handler, which just provides a response. Most of them are handlers. Now, here's the fluent configuration I was talking about. You can also do this uh, instead of with an uh, in, uh, attribute. You can do it fluently, which is easier if you need variable things or um, things that are not static available for uh, for an attribute. One question here is the specification actually says that it can also be done on the uh, resource level, so not on the sequence level. Would you be able to do this at the same time? Really? Here's someone who knows the spec. Yes, that's true. And actually, in the example, um, there are two of these methods. Uh, there is also a document type post. And we just uh, configure it the same way, except it's on method post. And it's on type custom. Yeah. Um, I told you this acts on the iPhone context, which is the counterpart to HTTP context. Um, but it is in Vonk and Fire terms. Uh, so it's easier to work with if you're implementing something in Fire. And uh, the use Vonka interaction uh, makes sure that you get that context into your method, as you saw in the previous uh, configuration code. So that lives inside of the normal HTTP pipeline. What if you actually want to access the raw HTTP context because there's something there that we did not translate to the Vonka context? That is possible. Then you just create normal HTTP.NET middleware. Um, 
And if you then need the von context, you can get it from the HTTP context with an extension method that will just get you the von context. So then you have both to work with. Uh, if you do this, you also have to um, connect it to the pipeline in the normal way. So you don't have the use of von interaction methods and all the automatic filtering. So you have to do the filtering whether you act or not. But if your phone context is sufficient, that's great. You have a request, you have a response. And an extra thing is arguments and a couple of other properties. Um, actually, we implement features as well, which is on the HTTP context also. Uh, yeah, one important thing, don't create this. Uh, we create it for you uh, from different places. Uh, there are different implementations. And uh, we don't expect you to build an implementation for this. So what's on the request? Uh, first of all, there's a lot of things. There's a path. So uh, what path was called? Like composition one, two, three. There's a method, which is directly relates to HTTP context. Um, what custom operation was called? Well, these are the things that you can filter on in your attributes, so you don't really need to do that yourself. Um, then there is uh, the interaction, also filtered by the attribute. And then there's the payload. That's the actual interesting thing to you. Um, to get the payload, it depends whether you your operation needs that payload or is merely interested if it's there. Um, most of the things you will implement will either need it or not. And if you need it, you just use the get required payload, which will automatically set a response if it's not there or if something is wrong with it. And you don't have to bother with that. Because all things can go wrong. It could be unparsable, the wrong uh, format or whatever, or absent altogether. So then you have a resource. Uh, in our case, the only interesting, when we get the, we have a get example, so we don't have a payload. You can't provide a, a body on a get request. Um, but there's also, you, Theo said, uh, the example of uh, on the type level, and then you can post a parameters resource that tells the operation what to do. And then you would need to get the payload and have a parameter resource. Arguments. Arguments can be all over the place in HTTP. They can be in a header. They can be on the path. Uh, they can be in the query string. And uh, for example, if we do slash composition slash one, two, three, then composition is actually a type argument. And the one, two, three is actually an ID argument. If you search, you can get all the search parameters also uh, as an argument. So uh, the source tells you where this actually came from, if you were interested. Um, there's also a must handle, which means sometimes uh, in internal code in, um, in Wonk, we say you must handle this attribute, otherwise we generate an error. error. Uh, but on search, for example, if you don't understand one of the search parameters, you can ignore it. It will just be reported as not supported, and you just search on whatever you do understand. So that's why not every argument must be handled. It has a status. You can see, oh, did someone already do something with this argument? Or um, is it in error? And obviously, you can tell it to go to error or to, that you handled it. Uh, if there's something wrong, just please fill out the issues and the details. And that will automatically be transformed to an operation outcome that is then returned to the caller. If you want to work with, uh, with the arguments, um, it's very uh, common to get the ID arguments that you're working on. So, and then you say, from the arguments, get me the resource ID argument. And then the value of it. Um, or by name. And this is how you tell them, I handled this. You can do that on a single argument or on a collection of arguments altogether. So then Vonk knows these are handled. I don't need to report anything to the user. 
when providing a response, you set the payload uh, if you have one. Um, in our case, we will return a bundle with all the results that we found that belong to this composition. You set the HTTP result, that's just an HTTP response code, which is normally defined in the spec what to return. And you can add some headers if that is applicable. Um, interesting thing here, for example, is it's not, it's um, very much like the HTTP headers, but in the example here, you see the location being added. And what ThinkFunk does is you don't have to care about the exact full URL for this. You just provide the location as it is from the bundle that you are creating, which is bundle some GUIs probably. Uh, Funk will make sure that the full URL matches the address that the client used to reach Funk, which can be different addresses, whether you're inside the company or outside the company, whatever, you don't have to care about that. So every URL is translated automatically on the way out. Inside, you just work with relative URLs. Now, if you want to um, debug this, and you probably want to, um, then what do you do? You can uh, set, uh, make sure that you can, uh, normally in your debug configuration, you run your pr own project, but we configured this as a library and you can't run a library project because there's no entry point. So what we do here is we set the VOC DLL, the server, as the entry point, and we set the working directory to the place where VOC is actually uh, located. Then, we still have to tell Vonk to actually load our plugin, because otherwise you still don't see it. Um, so we do that here in the plugin directory in the, in, the, in the pipeline options. We say, get it from wherever it's built. That's usually, some, this, is, this is my git repo directory, and it's under here. And there's an important thing. If we don't add this namespace to um, the pipeline, it will never be called. So this makes sure it will actually search my assembly and then add things from this namespace to, um, to the pipeline. And now you can build and run it. And what you will see is looking at the log again, our own plugin is showing up. So we see, if you configure this correctly, this document operation DLL that we built is actually being looked for. And we see here that on the root, the document configuration is on in order 4900. And a couple of services are loaded, that's true, that's our document service. And it's put in the pipeline because we use, use Funk Interaction Async with whatever. So it works. It appears to work. Um, if you are, if it doesn't work as you expect it, you can set the logging to verbose and it will tell you exactly why any of the configuration methods was or was not loaded. Because it was in an include, because it was in an exclude, because it was not in any include or whatever. So then you probably know what's wrong. Now, what, what kind of plugins could you use? Um, we have one here, it's a custom operation. And we have, but you could think of others as well. Um, one is logging, obviously, if you wanna um, audit or log things specifically to a system of your own, you could do a post handler and say, well, whatever comes by, I will log it to a system of my own. Um, on that note, Vonk itself uses uh, a system called Serilog, and that is already very flexible. It has m very many uh, syncs, so very many places that you can log to. So you can log uh, Vonk's own log to anywhere you like. 
for instance, we do that to a file, we do that to the console, we do that to application insights on Azure. Uh, you can do it to uh, Mongo, whatever. Um, auditing, so you could actually create audit events, for example. That's one plugin we will eventually provide properly. Uh, you could also um, do authorization. Smart on fire authorization is built into Vonk. But if you need something else, first of all, you probably want to act on the HTTP context um, to get to the user credentials, and then you can uh, define your own authorization before it enters the pipeline. You can add things to the phone context if you want, uh, because there are features in there. Um, and then you can evaluate those things later on in your services. There's a whole authorization framework, um, but that's another topic. But if you want to do specialized things, you can do that with the plugin. It would probably be a tree handler. And if something's wrong, you just short circuit. And you could do filtering. Um, let's say someone, you let people search. And then afterwards, you know, there are a couple of things that you are not allowed to see. So you just get them out of the search results and then return it. And you can probably make up things of your own as well. Um, there were these uh, little um, check marks, whether you do services or something actually in the pipeline. Typically, service-only components are if you build a, a facade, you provide repository services, uh, implementations of the search and the change repository. They don't show up in the pipeline, but they are services that need to be registered, so you still configure them, configure them the same way. You just leave out the configure method but, and do the configure services. You could also add other parcels or serializers if you want to get this to a um, format of your own, then you can actually do that. Um, maybe you want to consult with us because this, this is not trivial, but it can be done. So that's the last slide for this. Um, I could actually show you uh, how it works, that it works live. I chose not to do that during the presentation because I wanted to make sure I make it to the end. Uh, but we could also take some questions first. I think you were first, then you're second. Yes. Okay. Um, so, yeah, okay. uh, whatever order. We have plenty of time. Okay. Uh, I was just thinking about, uh, I would believe that uh, Funk is able to to generate the capability statement based on the operations that you implement and the attributes. Yes, yeah. true. That's true. Mm. Yeah, uh, actually that is so, uh, a little part of conf configuration that's not in the slides. Um, but you could just create a, uh, a static class that's called, uh, that adds to the capability statement. And you say, we support dollar document in code, and it will automatically be added to the, cap to the rest of the capability statement if that piece is loaded into the pipeline. And if it's not, it's also not in the capability statement. Yeah. Uh, but you have to do something for it in this case. Uh, yeah. You didn't speak at length about uh, batch or transaction, which in a way kind of, you have to, I guess, iterate through the, the latter part of the pipeline multiple times, right? Yes, is that, that is true. Yeah. Uh, I had transactions somewhere here in the yeah. slide, somewhere in front, accidentally. I think here. Yeah, I did see the handler, but. Uh, no, it's not here. It's in a previous example. All the way at the front, why? Here yeah, it was, yeah. <laughs> and it actually has a spelling error. I hate that. Um, but that is true. And it's one of the, um, I think, beautiful things of Wonk. Because <laughs> if you put something up here, if it's then being called in a transaction, it will automatically be called for every um, request in the transaction. You don't have to bother about that. Except it can that be done with .NET Core. You can kind of go through the pipeline multiple times. Well, that's not native to .NET Core, ASP.NET ASP Core web applications, but we made it work. <laughs> cool. I would not recommend you to do that yourself, because that is one of the harder parts of the application. Thanks. And uh, yeah. In this case, I didn't show it because all of the document is not allowed in uh, 
<coughs> in a transaction. Anything else? Yes. Um, so I didn't understand a bit about the um, authorization level. So you basically, um, how is the authorization interacting with the uh, extension exactly? So let's, let's say you um, want, you've got a bunch of sites running Fonk and you know if a physician is in the treatment chain and then you want to basically write an extension which pseudonymizes the data or not. Uh, would you necessarily need to interact with the authorization level of the app, of the extension? I, I'm, I didn't understand exactly how the authorization inter, um, interacts with the extension. Uh, there are levels of authorization. If, uh, if you can, um, if you have knowledge outside of Vonk, whether the doctor is actually treating this patient or not, uh, you might be able to uh, tell based on the patient in scope, or the patient that is information is being requested exactly. about, or whether to do the request or not at all, yeah. and then it's rather simple. Um, but for uh, Smart on Fire, for example, which is what we based it on, you can tell both what kind of resources you are allowed to access, whether you're allowed to read or write them, but you can also tell whether to confine to a certain compartment a compartment for a patient or for an encounter. Um, and we evaluated all the way through all the search parameters, um, which means uh, that if you want to add to that, you could also do that. So you can um, add, like add a search parameter on the request, add it your own parameter, and it will then be evaluated when things are searched. So that's how you hook into how the rest of the evaluation is done on a more granular, granular level. Um, there's a whole page in the documentation about how this is actually done for smart on fire scopes and how it's being evaluated throughout Bonk. Um, the interesting part about it, th by the way, is that if you build a facade, it will uh, only influence your search repository. Okay, is the, um, is the extension authenticated separately, so I'm using uh, something like OIDC OAuth 2, would I be able to authorize the extension separately or is it as, a, as a, an extension or is it basically part of the um, authorization of the whole uh, fire server? I, you can use the authorization information that is on the HTTP context in your extension if you wish. Okay. You would have to make the raw middleware a variant um, to get access to that information. Okay. But um, normally authorization happens in front here um, and then either it uh, uh, allows or denies altogether or it adds information to the VONC request to be evaluated later on because you have access but not to everything. Okay. Yeah. Anything else? No. Uh, I think we have three minutes left, um, which is should be just enough to show you that it actually works. Um, so here we have Vonk. Uh, yeah, I will move this to. Um, there we go. But now I can see it. Um, <laughs> yeah, we start from, and here you see all the configuration of the app settings, and then there we go. Uh, if you look up on this, by the way, we should be able to see whatever we. If I knew where my mouse was, uh, we'd be able to see what we just saw. Moving down, that's annoying. Here, so up here is the part that I showed you. <coughs> and then we have Postman, which I should also move to your side. And in the GitHub example, we have prepared a transaction bundle 
that contains all the information for the document that I'm about to create. It includes the composition and all the resources that go with it. And then, yeah, one second. I preloaded that already and then we can actually request this document. And that's interesting because, uh, actually this is what I wanted to see. The plugin is not loaded currently. So it says Spark or one not implemented. And if it is loaded, then we just change the configuration. But there's also a question, so that makes us choose what to do. Just a quick Perfect. one. Um, is there already like a, a marketplace for Wonk plugins, or are you planning on setting one up? Yeah, yeah, the latter. <laughs> We're planning on setting one up. Yeah, so you can just add your own. Maybe we'll have a look at it, whether it's actually not going to crash Wonk. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you can't do that, of course. Uh, so, uh, but yeah. So that's cool. Uh, here are the, apps and the settings for this, uh, which you can see. So I'm going to first, uh, yeah, here it is. What I did is uh, this part. I didn't read the plugin directly. So I can still add this, but it will never be found. So now we're going to do this, save it. Um, there's one thing. We can't do this while Funk is running. That's one limitation, but I think that's reasonable. It will not reload the pipeline on, um, while it's running. Yep, it's running again. Uh, now, it would be very nice if it would actually answer something meaningful. Otherwise it would be a late lunch. Huh? Otherwise it would be a late lunch, but it isn't. Yeah, no, it's not a late lunch. It works. It returns to 200. And it actually took a bit long because this was the first request when, it, when the application started up. Um, huh? <laughs> Uh, I believe that the return bundle for a document is actually search chat. I'm not sure that actually, but Alexander knows the exact <laughs> details for that. But you can correct that in the GitHub repository and do a pull request <laughs> and we will approve that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you're very welcome to do that. Um, so uh, here you get a get a result just just for a good measure. Um, it would be good to know that Ron can do this quite a bit faster than in the initial request. Yeah. So that's it. Um, I think it's about time to go to lunch. Enjoy. Thank you.